It's Saturday, April 6th. And today we are asking the question, how do we fix the crisis at the southern border? Like, really fix it? Our guest today helps provide a detailed and bipartisan evaluation of possible solutions. It's part two of our discussion about the biggest issue for a lot of voters this election year, immigration. Last Saturday, we talked with Sharon McMahon, known as America's government teacher, about the basics of U.S. immigration law and who has the power to do something about it. She also explained what's happening with that high-profile court case out of Texas. But today, our guest does a great job of explaining the things you won't see in the headlines, the things that perhaps even members of Congress don't know. Teresa Cardinal-Brown has many years of experience in border policy, with previous roles at the Department of Homeland Security, U.S. Customs and Border Protection, and others. She's now the Bipartisan Policy Center's Senior Advisor for Immigration and Border Policy and co-hosts their podcast, This Week in Immigration. Today, she's sharing the immediate impact the Texas case is already having on the immigration system. And then we dive deep into exactly what she's thinking about whenever there's a new idea to fix the crisis at the border. Welcome, welcome to the Newsworthy Special Edition Saturday, when we sit down with a different expert or celebrity every Saturday to talk about something in the news. Don't forget to tune in every Monday through Friday for our regular episodes, where we provide all the day's news in 10 minutes. I'm Erica Mandy. It's now time for today's Special Edition Saturday. (laughs) Teresa Cardinal-Brown, thank you so much for joining us here on the Newsworthy. Thanks for having me, Erica. So first, I'd love for you to just summarize or give us your big picture take on the situation at the U.S.-Mexico border right now. Well, I'd say it's definitely a crisis and it's a challenge. And it's been that way for, I think, going on a decade. The shift in terms of who is coming, it's no longer almost completely Mexicans. It's people from Central America, from South America, frankly, from 100 plus countries around the world in the last year. It's families with children, not just single adults, which had been the majority of encounters at the border for you know, the previous decades before the 2010s. And more and more people are turning themselves into Border Patrol rather than trying to sneak around them and asking to claim for asylum. And all of these three fundamental changes are really, really challenging and stressing the infrastructure, the personnel, the processes, the systems, and our laws that are meant to deal with migration at the border. So one of the more recent cases that has come up is in Texas. There's a new Texas law that allows state and local law enforcement to arrest people suspected of crossing the border illegally and then deport them. This law is currently on hold as there's this ongoing back and forth in the courts that could end up lasting months or more. So from a policy standpoint, what impact does a court case like that have on what's actually happening at the border? The lower courts still have to rule on it. The appeals court has to rule. Then the Supreme Court has to rule on it. So it could be months at least before we have a final decision and possibly longer. It all depends. And that's one of the frustrations, I think, for many of us on the policy side, looking at how we're trying to manage what's happening at the border is that all this back and forth is creating a whole lot of confusion and uncertainty at the border. Uh, From day to day, it's not clear what policies are in place. And frankly, that confuses the immigrants. It confuses our border patrol. And it allows the smugglers who are really profiting off of all of this to use that confusion to encourage more migration to happen. So one of the you know, if you will, effects of all of this litigation around our immigration policy is just, frankly, probably more confusion and possibly more immigration. And so the, you know, a lot of people are turning to Congress to take action. And we saw a bipartisan immigration bill be considered in Congress and it ultimately failed recently. Are you expecting new action? Are you expecting anything to come out of Congress anytime soon that could help? Well, expecting is a heavy word when it comes to our Congress. This Congress has been, by the numbers, actually one of the least productive Congresses in history. That having been said, at the very least, what happened in the Senate with that bipartisan bill, I think, has pushed more members of Congress to try to see if they can come up with something that can pass in a very narrowly divided Congress. Remember, the House has only a couple of votes in the majority for Republicans, and the Senate has only one vote in majority for Democrats. So it does take some bipartisanship to get anything done. And that's that's a challenge. It's also an election year. And we do know that election year politics played uh, heavily into what happened in the Senate. You know, electoral politics always plays into just about everything Congress does. And it's no surprise it's, it's happening here. But there's, I think, a very real sense in which people are, are trying hard to understand what's happening and come up with realistic, viable solutions. 
What is your take on some of the legislation that has been introduced, whether it was that bipartisan bill that ultimately failed or some of the new things that are being uh, written up in, in the House? Any thoughts on whether that type of legislation could have a significant impact on what's happening? So there are a couple of things that I do to evaluate uh, various pieces of legislation when it comes to the border. One is, does the legislation understand what it takes to implement what it's asking? For example, we've seen a lot of pieces of legislation that would order the federal government to reinstate some of Trump's policies that would cause the United States to force migrants to stay in Mexico or wait in Mexico while their cases are pending. But that requires the cooperation of the government of Mexico. And the government of Mexico has been very vocal, especially recently, in saying they will not reinstate that program that was under the Trump administration. They will not cooperate. And the U.S. Congress cannot force a foreign government to do something it doesn't want to. Then I think about operationally. Will Congress provide the resources to do whatever it is they're telling the administration to do? For example, some in Congress want to see every migrant who arrives, if they're not going to be sent right back to Mexico, detained. Well, we have never the Congress has never funded sufficient detention beds to detain everybody who, are, who is arriving right now, particularly if we're talking about families. So you can mandate something, but if you don't provide the resources, then that's not doable. So taking into account that so many immigrants are seeking asylum, how does that factor into your analysis at all? What we know about the migration that's happening right now is that by and large, many of the people who are arriving, particularly those that are asking for asylum, really are, I would say, much more desperate than many migrants in the past. And when I mean desperate, I mean, it's not just about, hey, it'd be nice if I could come to the United States and work for more money and send that back to my family for a while and then go back, which was a lot of the pattern of Mexican migration for decades. Now you have people taking thousand mile journeys through very deadly and dangerous terrain, such as the Darien Gap jungle between Colombia and Panama, with nothing but the clothes on their back, carrying infants and toddlers through knee deep mud, because they firmly believe that if they don't try to get to the United States, if they don't make it, they will die, or their children will die, or their family will be killed. And that level of desperation is not likely to respond to firmness of deportation or being put in detention. It, it, they won't like it, but it's not going to be worse than what they have already gone through. And so I think that we need to think about, would the things we're proposing actually make a difference to those kind of people? And more importantly, the smuggling organizations that are now encouraging and facilitating a lot of this migration, how easily would they be able to get around it? We have much more for you still ahead, including the difference between legal and illegal immigration today, why she compares some of it to America's tax system, and what part of it she says is the most misunderstood. Also, our guest explains what she thinks is and is not working about the Biden administration's new app to request asylum and why the U.S. is not the only country dealing with this type of crisis. All that and more coming up. But first, a break for our sponsors. Whether you hope to get outside and get active this spring or you just have a lot going on, you're going to want a deodorant that can keep up with you and doesn't just mask odor with fragrance, but actually works. Lumi is formulated with mandelic acid to stop odor before it starts. And when I first started using it, I was pleasantly surprised at how effective it is. And I've used it every day since. I also love that it's paraben-free, baking soda-free, pH balanced, so it's seriously safe to use anywhere on your body. Yeah, it's a whole body deodorant. And it's clinically proven to block odor all day long and control odor for up to 72 hours. And you can choose from a variety of fresh, bright scents. Two of my favorites are clean tangerine and cool cucumber. And as a special offer for listeners, new customers get 15% off all Lumi products with our exclusive code. And if you combine the 15% off with the already discounted starter pack, that equals over 40% off their starter pack. Use code NEWSWORTHY for 15% off your first purchase at lumideodorant.com. That's code NEWSWORTHY at lumi, L-U-M-E, deodorant, D-E-O-D-O-R-A-N-T dot com. This episode is also brought to you by Haya Health. So as most parents know, daily routines can be key for a happy home. 
And one of the routines that we've incorporated into our mornings is giving my toddler Haya vitamins. It comes in this really cute bottle he got to decorate with stickers. And most of all, he loves the taste. He always gives a little mmm noise when he pops his vitamin in his mouth. And yet, there's no sugar in there and no yucky gummy junk. Haya is pressed with a blend of 12 organic fruits and veggies, as well as 15 essential vitamins and minerals like vitamins D and C, B12, zinc, folate, and many others. It's specifically designed for kids two and up. Haya is non-GMO, vegan, dairy-free, allergy-free, gelatin-free, and everything else you can imagine. Basically, my toddler loves Haya vitamins, and I love knowing my toddler is getting the nutrients he needs. And we're all happy. Of course, I want you and your kids to be happy, too, so we've worked out a special deal with Haya for their best-selling children's vitamin. Receive 50% off your first order. To claim this deal, you need to go to HayaHealth.com newsworthy. This deal is not available on their regular website. Go to HayaHealth, H-I-Y-A-H-E-A-L-T-H dot com slash newsworthy to get your kids the full-body nourishment they need to grow into healthy adults. Okay, now back to my conversation with Teresa Cardinal-Brown from the Bipartisan Policy Center. Okay, so if legislation was passed, how long do you think it would take before any new policies would actually make a difference? There's no quick fix here. It took a decade for us to get where we are. We have seen this fundamental change in migration. Our existing policies and laws really aren't up to the task. It's definitely going to take more resources no matter what we decide to do. But whatever we do, I wouldn't expect it to have an immediate impact. Uh, We have to see these policies in place for many months, if not a couple of years, before we know whether we have successfully managed this in the long run. I think what you've described kind of also emphasizes the complexity of this issue and trying to solve it. Do you think most Americans understand how complex and nuanced this is? Absolutely not. I've been working in immigration 30 years, and I can tell you that most Americans don't understand how complex the immigration system is at all, unless they or somebody they know very well has gone through it. And then you get a firsthand look at how hard it is to immigrate legally, how different it is from what we studied in school as Ellis Island. That that model of immigration no longer exists. Our immigration system as it is right now is extraordinarily complicated. Federal court judges had said it's as or more complicated than our tax system. And I don't know how many Americans feel like they completely understand our tax system, much less our immigration system. Multiply that many, many more times when you're talking about the border. Um, If you haven't been to the border, first of all, it's not one border. It is one line uh, that is the border with Mexico, but it is very different geographic locations across that border with Mexico, from the river in Texas to mountains and canyons in Arizona and California to deserts terrain. It's very different. And what's happening at one part of the border isn't necessarily what's happening at other parts of the border. And what we can do to manage migration changes as the migration along that border changes. So there's no one size fits all policy here, I think. And there's also no quick fix. And and those are the things I think that many Americans don't understand, many members of Congress don't understand. But understanding those things are how we're going to get to real lasting solutions. And what do you want people to know about illegal immigration versus legal immigration in today's world, especially when it comes to what's happening at the border? Our legal immigration system, unless you have a family member in the United States or an employer in the United States to sponsor you, it's almost impossible to get a green card to the United States. We don't have temporary work visas for anybody who doesn't have a bachelor's degree and is going to work in a year-round job. There is no visa for that. So, you know, there's a lot of ways that it's very, very difficult for any of these people to legally apply. Um, It is illegal to enter the United States anywhere other than a port of entry. However, our law also explicitly states Regardless of how you enter, legally or illegally, once you're here, you are entitled to ask for asylum. You're not entitled to get it, but it means that under the laws it's currently written, we have to give you a hearing on that case. And I think a lot of people misunderstand that. They believe that if you enter illegally, then we don't have to let you ask for asylum. And that's not what our law says. But another reason why we see so many people coming between ports of entry is that for the last you know, decade, 
we have basically made it very, very difficult for people to apply for asylum at a port of entry. During the Obama and Trump administrations, we basically closed our ports of entry to people asking for asylum. And that meant that anybody who wanted to try to get here and ask for asylum was forced to go between the ports of entry. The Biden administration changed that by using this new app called CBP-1 to allow migrants in Mexico to request an appointment at a port of entry to go ask for asylum there. And the hope is that by doing that, we have fewer people going between ports of entry. That app has lots of issues. It can be difficult to use. We don't have enough appointments at the ports of entry for everybody trying to get in. So we're still seeing large numbers of people between ports of entry, but it has worked very well for certain types of people. For example, very few Haitians are going between ports of entry now. Instead, they're using CBP-1. Um, so it does have an impact when we provide alternatives. And yet the Biden administration has said it's preparing for larger spikes in migration this spring. Are you expecting the same? Will, will the number of people seeking asylum and trying to cross the border just keep rising? We know from the United Nations uh, High Commissioner for Refugees estimates that there are more displaced people in the world now than at any time since they've been recording it, including World War II. So this is part of a global phenomenon. And we do know because we keep tabs on how many people are coming up from South America through the Darien Gap. So we know more people are on their way. We're not the only country that is seeing high levels of asylum seekers. Mexico itself has seen record numbers of asylum applications. So have other countries in the hemisphere. I think it's worth understanding that this is not a problem we're going to solve only at our border. Unless we're working with other countries in the hemisphere to manage a migration that's already happening in other places, we're not going to succeed if we wait till, for somebody to get to our border before we manage this. Well, thank you so much to our guest today, Teresa Cardinal-Brown, for such an insightful conversation. For more analysis about immigration and the situation at the border and beyond, visit the Bipartisan Policy Center's website at bipartisanpolicy.org. And check out the podcast, This Week in Immigration. Thank you so much for tuning in to this special edition Saturday episode. If you found today's episode valuable, please be sure to share it with someone else today. It really helps us when you let others know that you listen to the Newsworthy and you encourage them to give it a try, too. We also always appreciate it if you leave a review and follow us in your favorite podcast app. Whether you love our special editions on Saturdays or our regular 10-minute daily news roundups every Monday through Friday, or hopefully both, we so appreciate you being here. And as always, we'll be back on Monday, keeping you up to date on the latest news to know. Until then, have a great weekend. <music>